Far too often what I see in horse training is people setting horses up for failure, looking for that failure, and then looking to correct the failure, looking to correct the mistakes. And the training focus is on that. It's on finding the mistakes and fixing them. It's on causing the mistakes and fixing them. Welcome to season five of the Willing Equine podcast, the podcast all about creating positive relationships between horses and people. I'm your host, Adele Shaw, a certified equine behavior consultant, horsemanship mentor, and all around horse lover. So I talk a lot about the use of positive reinforcement and or clicker training on this podcast and on my website and my blog and everywhere else because that's where I focus and my specialty area is in incorporating and coaching people on the use of positive reinforcement. And I do strongly believe that this you know, using positive reinforcement with horses is the way forward. I do believe that it is a just really powerful tool for our toolkit and, uh, and we can successfully work with and train our horses with positive reinforcement and we can eliminate the use of aversives, which is a major uh, component of negative reinforcement, which is uh, pressure and release. So I want to start off by saying, well, first two things. One, in this episode, I want to talk about negative reinforcement more. So as much as I do talk about positive reinforcement a lot, I think it's worth discussing negative reinforcement and how we can use it in a better way and how we can become more skilled and proficient trainers with negative reinforcement and how we can help our horses and help our clients' horses by improving our techniques and our understanding of negative reinforcement. I also want to say that, and I want to reiterate that negative reinforcement, again, does not mean bad reinforcement and positive reinforcement does not mean good reinforcement. They are not bad and good. They don't have any moral or ethical associations with them. We need, we need to remember that negative reinforcement is the removal of something as the reinforcer. So the removal of an aversive, whether it's super mild, um, even annoying, or just a little bit uncomfortable, that's fine, all the way up to something that's quite alarming or painful. So the removal of an aversive as the reinforcer for the behavior. So the aversive is present, it is applied, and then when the horse does the desired behavior, we remove that aversive and the horse goes, oh, okay, if I do that thing, the aversive stops. So that reinforces that behavior. Meanwhile, with positive reinforcement, we are adding something to the equation. We are adding something pleasant, appetitive, uh, following a behavior that is performed to encourage that behavior to happen more in the future so it gets reinforced with that pleasant thing, that appetitive thing. So we can think of it as pleasant versus unpleasant. We can think of it as, uh, and they're both reinforcers, so they both encourage more behavior. Um, And we just need to remember that these are very scientific, like mathematical equation. It's addition, subtraction. It's, there's no, like, we don't need to put a lot of emotion behind it. Now, naturally, because of the nature of using appetitives versus aversives, the, the appetitive thing is going to be more enjoyable for the most part. And now we're going to, we're going to dive into that a little bit more in a second, but the adding of something appetitive also incorporates classical conditioning, it incorporates, um, the developing of the pleasant associations. When something pleasant happens during a situation, our brain wires in such like where it's connecting those dots. Oh, this is good. This is, this has a good outcome for me. This is pleasant. This is enjoyable, right? So there is a lot of very pleasant we could say good things that come about when positive reinforcement is used well. And I think it just has a, it's, that's its superpower. I think that's positive reinforcement superpower, which is why I prefer to incorporate and rely heavily on the use of positive reinforcement in my training, in my behavior consulting, in, um, my courses, in my coaching and in working with my own horses. I heavily use positive reinforcement. I have dedicated countless hours to practice 
practicing and learning about the use of positive reinforcement. I am extremely, um, I've become extremely proficient at using it to train different behaviors. And I have really not found a limitation <laughs> to the use of positive reinforcement and what it can do. So this is all to say is that I do really find so much value in and I appreciate so much positive reinforcement. But I do understand as well and recognize that negative reinforcement, which is also called pressure and release, is heavily still used in the equestrian world. It is the most common form of horse training. It's how most people train behaviors. It's what you're going to find in almost every lesson program out there, at almost every competition out there, at almost every clinic and symposium and, you know, on and on and on horse fair is most heavily going to be negative reinforcement based. Um, all natural horsemanship is negative reinforcement based. All traditional, you know, comp competitive type training, show horse training, colt starting, all negative reinforcement based. If it's, it's about how they're using it, that, that, decides whether or not it's a really good program and whether or not the trainer, the clinician, the whoever, the horse person, whether or not they're really good horsemen and women is how they use negative reinforcement, how they apply negative reinforcement. And we could say the exact same thing about positive reinforcement because I watch and I have seen and I've witnessed firsthand and been around when people are using, by definition, positive reinforcement but it's being used in such a way where I would not consider it good horsemanship. I would not consider it pleasant even for the learner. And this goes back to positive reinforcement is not inherently enjoyable. It's not inherently pleasant. It's not inherently better. How you apply horse training, how you uh, work with horses, how you apply everything we know about horses and setting up their environment and everything that goes into the the experience for the horse plays a major major role in the experience for the horse and so this is going to set up today's conversation about talking about the use of negative reinforcement how we can improve our techniques and if we are in situations where maybe we do heavily use positive reinforcement but in this specific tech situation you choose as a behavior consultant, as a coach, as a trainer, as a horse owner, caregiver to use negative reinforcement, that's okay. And uh, because maybe maybe in this situation that is a better call for, you know, whatever it is. And I'll, I'll give you some examples about what that might look like. But I think um, there's so much that people could draw from positive reinforcement that the the mindset and the mentality and the techniques that are applied with positive reinforcement and that go with the, we'll call it the culture, the, the lifestyle of positive reinforcement, that there's so much you can draw from that to apply to our training with negative reinforcement that could dramatically improve the experience for the horse and make it an overall better, more effective as well, uh, experience for the horse and the human. Some of those are going to be timing. Uh, and I'm going to list out some other ones, but the first one, one we're going to talk about is timing. I have become so much more proficient and skilled with my timing of reinforcers with positive reinforcement and being able to bring that into my training with negative reinforcement has been just life altering. <laughs> it has dramatically improved the outcome for the horse, for the handler, for the student being able to improve the timing. There's so much focus on the use of the pressure in negative reinforcement training, which is important, but really the, the timing of the release, the timing of the release of the pressure, which is when the re that's the reinforcer, the timing of that is critical. And sadly, too many people are too ambiguous to too inconsistent and too um, just not clear enough, not consistent enough and not well-timed enough with their release of pressure or the application of pressure. Uh, but they really were focusing on the release here that it becomes 
unclear to the horse and it becomes frustrating and confusing to the horse and can cause some of the fallout that we see from poorly done negative reinforcement where the horse is frustrated, where the horse may even become a bit, a bit apathetic. They may become a bit dull. They are not re- very responsive. Um, they're not very responsive to the cues and then they're hard to teach. They're hard to teach new behaviors to because they have just kind of become, they, they're they just not paying attention as much. And why should they? Because the human is too inconsistent. The human is not clear. The human doesn't even know what they want. So how's the horse supposed to know what they want? So timing is such a critical piece to this puzzle for all good horse training. And it's something that I have my skills, even though I knew this was really important before and I was practicing it when I trained mostly with negative reinforcement, I was really good with my timing, but I'm even better now because of the use of the clicker and positive reinforcement. I've learned how to watch for the most precise timing and how getting that click in there just a fraction of a second too late could change the whole trajectory of, you know, the shaping of the behavior because the horse is at a different stage in the performance of that behavior. And so this is something that I, that has, um, allowed me to become so much more skilled as a negative reinforcement trainer is understanding the power of the timing and becoming more proficient with it with the clicker. And so even if you guys don't plan to use much positive reinforcement, I think it would be very powerful and useful to, to practice, to practice and train some behaviors for your horse and work with a coach and learn about the timing of using the clicker and, and the whole precision, all the precision that goes behind it, uh, that I think it could just make a world of difference for all of your training, even if you're not using positive reinforcement. Errorless learning is another concept. It's another um, training approach that I believe could dramatically change and improve training with negative reinforcement. So it's a it's an approach to helping our equine learners, but even your human learners, if you are a riding instructor or somebody like that who works with humans or just coaching, um, if you work if you're a professional of some in some capacity. Having this mindset of setting our learners up for success, so setting them up for success such that the right answer kind of accidentally happens, like they can't possibly get anything other than the right answer from the very, very beginning, but then also every step of the way as we are building the behavior. Far too often what I see in horse training is people setting horses up for failure, looking for that failure, and then looking to correct the failure, looking to correct the mistakes. And the training focus is on that. It's on finding the mistakes and fixing them. It's on causing the mistakes and fixing them. Even if the trainer isn't saying that's what's happening, a lot of times what I'm actually seeing is the trainer setting that horse up for failure unintentionally or intentionally, and then fixing the problem, fixing the mistakes that happen that the horse shows, that the horse demonstrates. Anytime you see, well, a lot of times when you see the before and after videos on social media where the horse is demonstrating the before behavior, and now a lot of times these are just done for, you know, sales or for marketing um, and also to show what is possible. So I understand when certain people, although I'm not, I don't typically do intentional before and afters, when I get an opportunity to have like a nice before and after, it is, it is good. Um, it was just an unintentional meaning that the client happened to get a before video or maybe it accidentally happened. Maybe I accidentally triggered it, which I would consider, you know, a mistake on my part, but it, you know, I didn't know. So, um, when I happen to get those befores, that's great, but I don't intentionally cause them because I don't need to cause the mistake to happen. I don't need to cause the undesired behavior to happen in order to resolve it. But when you see these photos, especially when they are intentionally, or these videos, when they're intentionally triggered on for social media whatever it is, or at clinics and symposiums and expos and all that, when the horse comes into the arena and they're like, this horse has a problem with bolting. And then the trainer is setting the horse up to bolt so that they can stop the bolting, right? So that they can fix it. So they can stop that behavior from happening and correct it. Now, whether or not you agree on the technique of correcting it and how that's done, 
kind of beside the point here. My, the whole reason of bringing this up is to show an example of what an errorless learning process is not. And that is not an errorless learning process. What I would consider instead, if I, we had a horse that was prone to bolting and I knew this, I took a detailed history. I even maybe saw some videos. Great. Fantastic. Okay. I'm looking for the context in which the horse bolts. Okay. So we decide the horse bolts when they are overwhelmed by the environment. There's too many people and maybe barking dogs. Let's say it's barking dogs. Okay. That's an easy one. So there's dogs barking and that triggers the horse to bolt. I am not going to intentionally play a recording of dogs barking to get the horse to bolt and then to stop the horse from bolting. That is not an errorless learning process. What an error, what it would look like instead is let's go and practice our leading. Let's make sure that our leading mechanics are down. Let's make sure that the horse understands the tactile leading cues. And then let's see if we can just have a dog, a very, very quiet dog with very good manners around horses, just sitting off at a far, far distance and not barking. And let's see if we can continue our leading behaviors and heavily reinforce the leading behaviors. Okay, great. Now let's progressively move the dog closer and closer and closer. Okay, great. We have worked through and we've, you know, identified that the horse now is comfortable leading when a dog is present, but it has to do with the dog barking. Okay, awesome. So now what I'm probably going to do, and I'd have to, you know, be situation by situation. What I might do at this point is to probably get an audio recording of a dog that's barking, but have it at a really low level, a level that is under the threshold for the horse. And so they are able to gently be exposed to the barking in a controlled setting where they have been set up for success. And then it, I would gradually increase that stimuli, I'd gradually increase the barking, whether it's in volume or proximity. And then we would change to different types of dogs barking on audio recording and then to a live dog. And this would allow me every step of the way to show the horse an alternative behavior that I would like them to perform, a set of behaviors that are safer for them to perform. I would be setting them up for success. And additionally, I would keep be keeping them under threshold so I'm not re-triggering this fear response and then potentially deepening that or causing more harm than good. And I don't, you know, this is how we would approach preparing our horses and systematically desensitizing them to the thing that they're worried about. And of course, this errorless approach applies to all training. It's not just about things that they're scared of. So we could look at an example such as, let's say I want to teach the horse to back up. If I'm setting my learner up with an errorless approach, with a setting, setting them up for success, I'm not going to start off with them, you know, backing up a hill and there's a fence behind them and I'm asking them for three steps backwards right away. That would not be helpful. Uh, and that would set them up to make a lot of errors and a lot of mistakes. And that is just not really good training. And so instead, I'm going to change the environment to be suitable for this behavior to help encourage the behavior. I'm going to look for a very, very small step towards that. I'm also going to position my step, myself in a, an appropriate position to help support the behavior that I'm looking for. And then, of course, then the timing comes into this as well with, you know, timing when the reinforcer happens. This all really gets wrapped up into that idea of errorless learning and setting our learner up for success. And any good horse person, really skilled trainer, a trainer that wants their horses to succeed and wants them to get the right answer. And, and a lot of trainers will say these things. They'll say things like um, make the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard or some variation of that. But when we watch them actually train our they doing that? Or are they putting their horses in an environment where they are struggling to find the right answer and then they're correcting, aka making the other responses hard because they're correcting and punishing or adding pressure on when the horses get the wrong answers and only making it easy, aka reinforcing a desired response? That to me is not, that's not what I'm talking about here. Instead, I think a really skilled and good trainer that wants their horses to get the right answer that understands how learning works and understands that you don't have to punish or correct responses to help the horse learn what it is they are supposed to do. Like you don't have to get the wrong answer to understand the right answer. 
So a really good trainer, really good horse person will instead go back in the training and put the horse in an environment in a setup where they are almost unintentionally going to stumble upon the correct answer and then get that reinforcer right away. And then the next approximation, the next little step that we're going to be looking for, again, almost accidental and gets that reinforcer right away. And so we build this behavior systematically, whether it's with negative reinforcement or positive reinforcement. Such in such a way where the horse is constantly getting right answers, correct answers. So that would be that errorless approach. Now, will errors happen? Will mistakes happen? Of course, we're, we're living in real life. Things happen. But the, that's the goal. That's what we're working towards is helping supporting our learner in such a way where they get those quote, correct answers over and over and over and over again. We're not looking for them to, we're not intentionally causing them to make mistakes and causing them to have errors and wrong answers, incorrect answers for them to learn. That's not the approach that we're after. So that all falls into that errorless learning. And absolutely, this errorless learning idea can be applied to negative reinforcement or pressure and release type training. Another aspect of this that really ties into all of that is shaping plans. Uh, I find that shaping plans are heavily talked about in the positive reinforcement community, in the positive reinforcement type training. And while they are being applied or they should be being applied with negative reinforcement pressure and release, people don't really talk about them. We have this generalized vague idea of where we're going towards, what behaviors we're looking for, what we're trying to build towards and shape towards. But nobody sits down and breaks down the steps towards that. And if they do, it's under the the guys under the whole like method program that you have to really buy into. And it's the step-by-step program, but there's not this, there's not this understanding of that shaping plans can be applied to every type of training, not just a certain method. And shaping plans is more about having a clear understanding of where you are going towards in the training of that specific behavior and what steps are going to take you there. It's like having a map, a road map towards your destination versus just having a general vague idea of what that destination is and then floundering around until you get there. In good shape, Shaping plans, good roadmaps are not just going to be clear to the human, but they're going to be clear to the equine, to the horse, to the dog, to the cat, to the fish, to the, the lizard, the snake. It's going to be a very clear, straightforward path for them. And they're going to be able to see those next steps. They're going to be able to see the path ahead as the journey unfolds, as the shaping plan unfolds. And nobody's ever going to be in the dark. And we can have a good understanding of what shaping plans are and apply this with negative reinforcement or positive reinforcement. And so to really look at what a shaping plan is. Um, a shaping plan is when you have, like I said, a goal behavior in mind. So again, let's go look at the backup again. So we have the idea of this behavior we want to teach, which is the backup. Great. Fantastic. How are we going to get to the backup? Do we just start asking for backup like steps? Do we start with three steps backwards? Is that what we're looking for? Um, or do we need to first look at how we're going to set the horse up for, so we talked about that, um, the antecedent arrangement, the environment where we are standing, all that. We also need to have a good idea of what our cues are going to be. So is it turning and facing the horse? Is it a lead rope cue? Is it the verbal cue backup? Is it a hand towards the chest? Whatever it is, whatever that cue is, that's important to, to note, to be clear about and to have a good understanding. And then we need to break down the approximations, the, the bite-sized pieces of this goal behavior. So we're not going to be asking for even a full step backwards to begin with. It's just a little weight shift backwards. And then the reinforcer, a little shift backwards, a reinforcer. And we do that a bunch of times. And then we start asking for the next step, which is a bigger shift backwards than of the reinforcer. And we do that a handful of times. And then it's a little bit bigger shift, maybe even into a step backwards. Then they get the reinforcer, do that a bunch of times. And you can see how we're going to build this into three, four, five, six, whatever, however many steps you want when you cue the back up and whatever that's going to look like followed by the reinforcer. That's looking at the overall goal behavior and breaking it down into smaller pieces and having a clear visual, a clear guide of clear path in shaping that behavior. So that's that shaping plan. And this could be a literal plan that's written down, or if you've taught the backup a million times before and you have a good understanding of what this behavior looks like and the path you're going to take, maybe you don't write it down every time. You just have a general idea in your head and you uh, go out and approach working with that horse with with that general shaping plan in your mind, that's okay as well. But having those shaping plans 
whether the reinforcer is the release of the pressure or the click in the food, same, same principle, like same idea. And it can really benefit the training regardless of how you're training. One I touched on and that I want to come back to is the idea of really focusing on the reinforcer itself and having a high rate of reinforcement. And in positive reinforcement training, we focus on this a lot, making sure that we're not withholding reinforcers, making sure that the reinforcement is plentiful, that even that they have alternative access to reinforcers. So for us with the positive reinforcement, let's say you, you know, you have limited introduction to positive reinforcement. So I'm going to kind of walk you through what that would look like, at least how I train it and how I work with positive reinforcement, which gentle reminder that positive reinforcement is not a method and everybody who trains with positive reinforcement, clicker training, whatever you want to call it, has a different technique, a different way of applying it. So um, I will talk about how I do it based on what, you know, how I've learned and how I find it to be most effective and ethical and all that, which is that when I'm working with positive reinforcement, my rate of reinforcement stays pretty high for the most part. There are certain behaviors that I put on like variable rates of reinforcement or variable reinforcement schedules just because they have to be able to be performed without consistent access to reinforcement. Those are pretty limited as far as what those behaviors might be. Something like backing away from people that come to the gate might be a behavior like that because one day my kids might come up to the gate and I need the horse not to stampede over them. That might be a behavior that I don't reinforce every time and so I get it on a more varying schedule which is fine. But most behaviors I pretty heavily um, keep, I maintain with reinforcement and this is, this is how it is with negative reinforcement as well. Um, actually negative reinforcement is even easier to maintain on a consistent, more consistent schedule because there's always the release, right? We never don't release for when, when we're training with negative reinforcement. If you did, if you just absolutely never released for a behavior, uh, the behavior would disappear because there's no reinforcement following it. So this is again, going back to that understanding of it's not the pressure itself that reinforces it's and creates more of that behavior. It's when the reinforcer happens. It's when that release happens, that reinforces the behavior. (laughs) It's a reinforcement that reinforces. Anyway, it's, um, it's when that reinforcer is happening, that tells the horse, oh, that was the correct behavior. It's not the pressure itself. So we need to be very mindful of remembering to reinforce the behavior and keeping it on pretty high rate of reinforcement, especially if it's a very, very important behavior. So what this might look like when you've developed lots and lots of behaviors, let's say you're doing advanced under saddle work, a more variable reinforcement schedule for a behavior might be... Um, You know, sometimes you ask for, we'll go for dressage for my dressage people that are like me. This is an easy example that came to my head. When you're training uh, flying lead changes uh, and and like tempies, right? So let's say we're doing, um, we're doing every other, right? And so you ask for a flying lead change and then, or yeah, so we're going to do one piece tempies. So you ask for the change and then you ask for another change and then you ask for the change this is an advanced horse. Okay. And then you release, you stop asking for the changes, you move on. Right. So that reinforcement happened, but then the next time you may not ask for three, the next time you're only going to ask for the one so that the horse stays fresh, stays eager to do it. You're not always demanding more and more and more. So the horse is going to do a one time change and you're going to release for that. Perfect. Great. The next time you might come in and do two, then you might go back to one, then you might go all the way up to four. And so you're varying when you're reinforcing for that behavior, but there is still always some level of reinforcement that is happening for that behavior at some point. Same idea with positive reinforcement. If we get so stuck on this idea of, um, just limited reinforcers and not wanting to feed all the time, which I know people get really hung up on the idea of, I just don't want to be feeding all the time. I I understand it because there's a cultural ick around feeding horses for some reason. And I understand because I grew up that way too. And I had that ick as as well for a very long time. But when I start to translate it over to what it looks like, what good negative reinforcement training looks like, it makes sense. And it would be actually really, it makes sense to reinforce often and frequently um, and consistently and not withholding reinforcers. So when we get to the point, like if we get this idea in our head that we just want to reduce how much food we're using, if ever, we're, what we're actually saying is the same idea of, well, I just never want to release pressure ever. I just want to hold the pressure forever and my horse should just do whatever I ask and never have to have that release or it should be very minimal, but maintain, you know, enthusiasm, maintain willingness, maintain um, a happy attitude, like all of that. That's not fair. So we need to keep this understanding of 
in this idea of maintaining a higher rate of reinforcement and reinforcing small efforts, reinforcing even just the willingness to engage, the willingness to try. And this is something that I apply with positive reinforcement as well. There's I do something called reinforcement for effort where when my horse is just engaging with me and participating, even if they didn't get the quote correct answer, you know what? That's fine. I'll toss some food into the pan. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you for trying. Let's try again. And I'll set them up differently. I'll ask differently. However, I need to do it to help the horse out. But the idea is that I'm still, they're still engaging with me. They are still offering some level of behavior that I'm looking for. And they are still being active participants and still very willing to participate. So I want to reinforce that just like we would do and we can do and we should do with negative reinforcement as well. Your horse is offering you anything, go ahead and reinforce it. Like try not to be super greedy, which then leads me into my other thing here is Greedy trainer syndrome is very prevalent across the board in horse training, whether it's with positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. And having a a mindset of being willing to reinforce more often and reinforcing efforts, which ties into the high rate of reinforcement, uh, rate of reinforcement. Yeah. So it, it, that combats and that actively goes against the greediness that sometimes we can get into this idea that we want more, 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 better, 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 perfect, perfect, perfect. If we have a, instead a mindset of just being willing to reinforce just being here today and engaging, that doesn't mean we can't do more, but just having that willingness to do that can really help improve the quality of the experience for both the horse and us. We can still train for improved behaviors. We can still train for more advanced behaviors. We can still make progress on behaviors, but it's also okay to say thank you for just engaging. It's also okay to ask for less and reinforce that. It's also okay to maintain a higher rate of reinforcement to keep that excitement level up and that engagement level up, I should say, and that willingness level up, whether it's with negative reinforcement and then that's the release of the pressure. So it's happening more often. It's happening for less effort, et cetera, or it's the click in the reinforcer of the food reinforcer when it comes to positive reinforcement. But this, um, this principle, this idea, this, uh, desire to have that higher rate of reinforcement and to avoid that greedy trainer syndrome, I believe can dramatically impact the quality of the experience for horses and the effectiveness when it comes to negative reinforcement too. So the last one I want to talk about is the humane hierarchy and Lima, specifically the humane hierarchy. So the humane hierarchy is about meeting the learner's needs and addressing behavior through a hierarchy of needs and hierarchy of the most supportive, well, and this is where Lima comes in, like least intrusive, minimally aversive, but also making sure that their needs are met, making sure that this behavior is not actually coming from a place that has nothing to do with training. So are they feeling well? What does their environment look like? Are all their needs being met? Are they um, hurting or in pain today? Have they had enough social interaction? Are they getting enough sleep? What's their diet like? All of these things need to come first when we are addressing uh, problem behaviors. And then we start down this, start down the hierarchy of moving towards more invasive um, and a little bit more intrusive approaches to problem behaviors or any behavior at all, any type of training. And the humane hierarchy is a framework that was developed by Dr. Susan Friedman that outlines a hierarchy for behavior change procedures. And it starts off with, like I said, wellness, nutritional and physical. So we're looking at, you know, how's the horse feeling? How are they doing in their own body? Do they feel comfortable in their own skin? What, uh, what's, if there's any pain going on, are they getting enough sleep? Are they getting enough social interactions? Or do they have enough room to move? How are their feet doing? Do, is this a saddle fit related issue? All of this fits into that wellness. That's the first stop. Whenever we're training behaviors, whenever we are, especially problem behaviors, but any type of interactions with our horses, we should always be looking first at the wellness. Next is antecedent arrangements, which is about the environment and even including where people are standing. What are you doing? Doing? How do you have sunscreen on your hands that day? Um, are you wearing a new perfume? Are you yelling too loud? Is it too windy today? Is the, you know, can they see, <laughs> you know, that just this, maybe the sun's too bright. Antecedent arrangement is about, you know, we're seeing this problem behavior or we're seeing a specific behavior that we would like to train and, or we want to see a specific behavior. Can we arrange the antecedents to 
accommodate that, to actually organically cause that behavior to occur without us actually intervening, without us actually stepping in and, you know, in training the horse to do that behavior. The next thing on the humane hierarchy is positive reinforcement. Um, and then it keeps going down. Negative reinforcement is there as well. And then positive punishment, which is like the correction of behaviors, which can include pressure used at certain times. So if you use an aversive pressure to decrease a behavior, that's positive punishment. And again, going back, positive does not mean good. It just means the application of something to, and, and then punishment means to decrease. So the application of an aversive to decrease the likelihood of a behavior behavior occurring again is positive punishment. And that's all the way at the bottom of the humane hierarchy. When it comes to negative reinforcement based training, I believe firmly that we can be applying the humane hierarchy here. Now, while negative reinforcement is further down than positive reinforcement on the humane hierarchy, I still want to heavily focus when I am using negative reinforcement with this client. Maybe I can't in that time use positive reinforcement. I don't have time to introduce it, whatever it is, or the, the client is limited on what she has access to. Maybe the barn has said, you can't use that here. I don't know what it is for whatever reason. I, it's not a situation where I can use it. I'm still going to be looking at wellness and nutrition and physical first. And then I was, then next I'm going to be looking at antecedents. And this is going to be extremely important. And we also have to remember that positive reinforcement doesn't always mean food. Um, it could mean scratches. It could mean, you know, if the horse wants to get out of a gate to go to the pasture, what behavior are we reinforcing before we open the gate? That And then that gets positively reinforced when they get access to go out to the pasture. So we have to look at different ways that we can use positive reinforcement as well. And then we have to remember that things like positive punishment are all the way down at the bottom of the list there. The last stop probably shouldn't be used. Um, and that's all the way at the end. And I, I do believe that when we're going to effectively and humanely use negative reinforcement, we should be having the humane hierarchy in mind. So Lima is short for least intrusive, minimally aversive, and it's about behavior intervention. It's about modifying behavior. And it's all about specifically choosing to take the least intrusive approach to modifying a behavior. So most intrusive would be coming in with, you know, my horse is biting people. We're going to smack it in the face every time I bite somebody. That would be a very intrusive, abrasive approach to modifying that behavior versus, let's say, a horse is biting people and, um, and then looking at, and again, this is why the humane hierarchy really plays into this whole situation and they kind of go hand in hand a little bit. The Lima approach to that would be, okay, why is the horse biting people? What can we do to change the antecedent arrangement so that the horse isn't even inclined to bite at people? Maybe it's because too many people pass by his stall every day and they've been um, threatening him. I don't know what it is, but we could teach the people not to threaten him. And then maybe we change his stalls so that he is not in a place where people walk past him all the time. Well, that's a very minimally intrusive approach to modifying that behavior. Now, every situation is different because in that situation, maybe actually it would be more intrusive to move that horse to a different stall because he struggles with being stalled. His companion is right next to him and that helps him a lot. But if you move him to a different stall, he'd have to be separated from his companion and that would be extremely stressful. So that's actually going to be more intrusive. And so then we would have to look for a different approach, not saying that now we use positive punishment, but there's maybe, you know, there's at least 20 different things we could try before we get all the way down to smacking this horse every time in the face when somebody walks by his stall. So it's Lima is very much uh, about the individual's experience level and their it's up to their discernment pretty much based on the situation. There's not a hard, fast set of rules for Lima. But again, this is something that can be applied when we're using negative reinforcement type training as our primary focus. We can be applying the ideas of Lima to this as well. Another thing to consider is how we're using negative reinforcement as a whole. Uh, there's a lot of times where I see people using negative reinforcement and they're coming in with a high level of pressure right away and their subtle, the subtlety is really lost. There's not a lot of gentleness or subtle intentional pressure use. It's very abrasive and horses are extremely sensitive. They're extremely sensitive and aware of our littlest shifts. And for a lot of horses, 
let's say you're asking the horse to back up, they, they can uh, detect, you know, a shoulder lean towards them. And that can be a level of pressure for them. And we can just hold that rather than increasing it. Instead, what a lot of people want to do is they want to jump right towards walking into the horse or swinging ropes or things like that. And that is a very, very high level of pressure when it's not necessary. And so we want to go back and really evaluate what is necessary as far as a level of pressure and could we do this quieter? Could we do this gentler? And I think in most cases, we absolutely could. In most cases, humans are prone to using an excessive amount of pressure and force when it is absolutely not necessary. And then as far as the escalation level and when you escalate, if ever, it it should be very, very, very systematic and very slow to escalate and giving the horse a lot of time to process it and to make decisions. And I think we should be really careful when we decide to escalate and making and going back potentially and looking at that humane hierarchy again and considering why isn't the horse responding to this lower level of pressure? Why are we needing to increase? And so we should be asking ourselves a lot of questions before we start that process of increasing our degree of pressure uh, to get the horse to do what it is we're looking for. We should be stopping ourselves before we start to move to that option and reevaluating why this horse may not be wanting to do the behavior we're asking for. Some other things that have come along with my journey of learning about positive reinforcement and really diving into this area of horse training and training horses this way is a and tremendously improved awareness and education around equine emotions and behavior in general and also their body language. I had spent my whole, I've spent my whole life around horses. I've known horses. I've read every book you can imagine on horses and studied under so many different people. I've done as At the time, there weren't really many courses available, but there was other things like clinics and DVDs you could rent and magazines. I had all the horse magazines. I had everything. I was (laughs) well-studied. And I still had such a incorrect understanding of horse body language and horse behavior as well as equine emotions. And that's something that I really encourage you guys, no matter what type of training you're doing, is to take the time to study these things and to study, you know, what does it mean when a horse licks and chews? Because it's been prevalently taught that licking and chewing means the horse is processing and thinking, when in fact it doesn't mean that uh, at all, actually. And it has more to do with the nervous system and regulating. Uh, it's also been thought, you know, for the longest time, most of you guys are aware that d- dominance and leadership and alpha mare and all of that was just well taught and well recognized when that has been completely debunked and it's not true. Um, we've also had a misunderstanding of some other things about horse eyesight and their depth perception and their sense of smell and hearing and all these different things that were taught for a long time that now we know better. And now I, um, it's taken me a long time and I'm still every day, I'm still learning. I'm still adapting and learning with the rest of us as we're all, there's more research that's coming out. We're discovering more. I'm sure things that I know today, I will unlearn tomorrow, hopefully (laughs) if it comes available and it's a new thing. I'm always learning. I'm always adapting and growing as a horse person. But for those of you guys that maybe, um, also have come from a similar background as me and there is a lot of new updated information. You're not sure what is right or what is wrong and based on what we know now. And maybe you're just, you want to double check and make sure that you're on the right path with your horse. Or maybe you want to dive more into behavior and how horses learn or how you could apply negative reinforcement better or start learning about positive reinforcement. I have a course that's available now that, um, they, of course, you guys could sign up for. It's called Horsemanship for Harmony, and I dive into all this. I dive into how to create shaping plans, how to avoid greedy trainer syndrome, the humane hierarchy, Lima, body language, reading uh, body language thresholds, so fear thresholds and trigger stacking. I uh, look at problem solving, so what to do when your horse is not doing what you ask them to do and things are not going well, how to break that down and problem solve. And I also go into talking about the differences between positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement as well as negative punishment and positive punishment. So behavior, a quick introduction to uh, applied behavior analysis and um, operant conditioning, classical conditioning, all of that in that course. And that's available to everybody. And it doesn't specifically talk about or dive into the application of positive reinforcement in that course or even negative reinforcement. It's more of the foundations to understanding how to be effective in those. And then the follow-up courses dive into the actual application of positive reinforcement 
in an effective uh, way that is centered around humane hierarchy in Lima and also helping promote willingness in your horse in a way where they are happy and enjoying the experience and it's not um, stressful for anybody. So I teach that in the follow-up courses. But the first one is Horsemanship for Harmony. But also, you guys, I have tremendous, I have so many resources available on my website, also on this podcast and the blog. So if it's not the right time for you to buy a course or courses aren't your thing, you can always look up all this information through different books and blogs and podcast episodes and YouTube videos, as well as do your own research too. So the information is not gatekept, I promise. Um, I've just put it together in a more concise and digestible way, an easy to follow way that is just ready for you all in one place and is through an interactive kind of video format. And so if that's something that interests you, you could um, sign up for that or there's all those other resources available for you too. I have a lot of free resources out there as well. Um, but I do hope that this was, this conversation was really helpful in understanding how we could improve our use of negative reinforcement to help improve the effectiveness, but also the quality of the experience for both the horse and ourselves and help um, improve that relationship with our horses and make it an overall better experience so that we both enjoy it and have a true partnership. Thanks so much for listening. If you have any questions, please do email me at info at the If you'd like more information on my courses, coaching, consulting, or even access to free resources, please do check out my website, the If you like this podcast or this episode, please do leave feedback on the platform that you listen to it on.